Uh, that brings us to the next speaker. He is an original because there is no one in this world who's actively practicing, who's got more clinical experience with low-carb diets than Dr. Eric Westman. He's worked with Dr. Robert Atkins himself, and his depth of clinical experience can only teach us things that we don't know. So, uh, Dr. Westman? Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here and give you a perspective on two decades of experience with low-carb diets. I'm happy working in a clinical practice at Duke Tuesday through Friday, pretty much every week. And uh, it's uh, been an, uh, interesting to just give a little time to reflect. Uh, Dr. Uh, Nadir asked me to talk about the last two decades, and um, here's what I came up with. So let's see. A couple disclosures. Um, with Jimmy Moore, we wrote a couple books. Uh, anyone read Keto Clarity, Cholesterol Clarity? Is anyone following a keto, low-carb diet? Raise your hand. <laughs> so, keep your hand up, please. Um, look around. You're not alone. Um, how many of you have been following? Oh, no, hand's still up. How many of you have been following it more than six months? Keep your hands up. One year, keep your hands up. Five years, keep your hands up. Ten years, keep your hands up. Twenty years. Well, I guess it's just me. Um, Hope, Jeff, Jeff Gerber, a couple of others. So, but um, it was in the first clinical presentations that I gave, research presentations, that I realized that the science wasn't going to be enough. And that's going to be one of the themes in this. Um, and then there are a couple new companies we've created to try to scale up the availability of the teaching and also truly low-carb and healthy products. And I won't talk about those today. So looking back, I got into this in 1998. The first thing a clinical researcher is going to do uh, so my pedigree is I uh, trained at Stanford, which was interesting as an undergrad, that uh, Gary Taubes has a Stanford connection as well, and then went back home to the University of Wisconsin, the University of Kentucky, for residency, and ended up at Duke for a clinical research fellowship. And the first thing you do as a, as a researcher is to do a retrospective or, or chart or a clinical literature review. And so we did in the late 90s, and we looked back and the most recent paper was written in 1980 on a low-carb diet. So the first thing you want to do is, is anyone else published in this area? And so in 1980, I just have to point out that there were 24 people in a non-randomized trial. And the, just reading in this abstract, uh, during this time, uh, the high-protein, low-carb diet resulted in substantial weight loss probably due to a combination of salt and water loss as well as caloric restriction, although they didn't really measure those things. Um, the, and then plasma triglycerides fell as well. Significant increases in LDL cholesterol happened. And the HDL failed to rise, although this was really just a um, several week study. And it was the LDL rise, and you go look at the paper, it was a very small increase in LDL. But this was the you know, nail in the coffin for studying the low-carb diet for 22 years. 24 subjects, non-randomized trial. In fact, looking back, they rustled together workers at the NIH with the purpose of showing that the diet was bad. And you look at the, the paper today, it was actually good except for that pesky LDL that you're hearing a lot about today. Um, it's uh, interesting to see that um, that was the reasoning back, wait, so let me count that up, this, uh, 38 years ago? Just think about that a minute. So a couple patients in my clinic at Duke 
were doing this kind of diet and I was curious about it. And Jeff Volick and I, in 2002, published the first studies on the low-carb keto diet in 22 years. Two decades. No studies. This is called a taboo, where you're not able to study something. It's, a, uh, it's said that science is a self-writing endeavor. The truth will always be found, not if there's a taboo on studying something. You have to have free access and freedom to study everything in order for the truth to come out. Um, So two patients at the VA in Durham and at Duke did this kind of diet. I was curious about it. Uh, ended up uh, visiting Dr. Atkins, who was the only real practitioner who had a big practice at the time. I asked him, what do you do? We went back to Duke to study it. And now I have over 46 peer-reviewed papers on the keto and uh, low-carb diet. This is a popular video from dietdoctor.com. There's some other videos out there that give kind of the simple approach that we've studied in many studies now. After the years of doing research, I, I thought everyone was going to be doing this, so I opened up a clinic about 12 years ago, and I'll give you some uh, experience from that clinical experience as well. So what I've learned is that there are a lot of uh, ways to define the world. Uh, you could do it religiously, you could do it sociologically. How about science? How about scientifically? And so when you look at the low-carb keto diet in terms of grams of carbs per day, and it's total grams, not net, when you get under 50 or under optimally 20 grams per day, the biologic appearance of ketones in the breath, blood, and urine occur. And that's what's known as a ketogenic diet or a keto diet. And it turns out if someone has extra weight on their body, they start eating less and they start losing their fat weight, which is why this is known predominantly as a weight loss diet. But it's really a keto diet is really a fat burning diet and you cut the carbohydrates down, you start burning fat in your body and fat from the food. And the best definition I've seen, and there was a group effort in the paper in 2007 that we wrote in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition that defined a low carb diet as 50 to 100 grams per day, and then a ketogenic diet under 50 grams per day. Some people may need to be under 20 grams per day, and that's the clinical application of this scientific uh, information. Now, put in all these other diets and terms, and this is the confusion that I see today, and also what's most important in a keto diet. Some people aren't able to figure that out with the information availability today. I hope to clarify some of that. And then how you define keto, and is it, or keto, is it based on a blood, a breath, a urine marker, or, or is, it, is it just the absence of hunger and that you're uh, feeling better and you're achieving the metabolic goal you want. All of those, I think, are valid ways to say you're doing a keto diet. You don't have to measure the ketones. So stepping back and teaching, if, it, um, if you were talking to a friend or neighbor about this, you can explain that this is, there, yeah, there are good carbs and bad carbs. And actually, the bad carbs, or the, the junk foods, if you will, are not part of any popular, any effective popular diet program. There are a lot of things that can work, but you want to focus on the good carbs or good vegetables and uh, maybe small amounts of fruits. Um, at first, I wouldn't recommend that, though. Um, another uh, kind of stylized version of what you can eat is uh, from dietdoctor.com. Uh, these are just healthy, fresh foods. Um, in a question and answer yesterday, someone asked, what about children? And I was hoping that Andreas would say, well, it's just food. Of course children can do this. You know, well, what about people who are 80 years old? I, it, it's just food. And, and um, yeah, so anyone can do this. And the worry we have now today is that people are on so many medicines that the medicines may become too strong that for someone uh, in a medical system. 
So the way that we learned based on um, Dr. Atkins, Dr. Eads, Dr. Bernstein, Dr. All of, all of the books written and the doctors in the late uh, uh, 20th century, basically we kept people 20 grams of carbs per day total, not net carbs. You eat until you're comfortably full of meat, poultry, fish, and shellfish, and eggs. Two cups of salad vegetables per day, one cup of a low carbohydrate vegetable per day, limited cream, oil, cheese, and mayonnaise because they're high, they are high calorie items. Um, calories are not restricted. You just follow an ad lib, eat when you're hungry kind of approach. And carb intake slowly increased as the weight goal approached. Here are all of the papers, uh, starting in 2002, uh, the American Journal of Medicine. Um, so for me, um, 16 years ago, we published, which means it was about 18 or 19 years ago when we started the research. It occurred to me that unless you put 50 people on the program, whatever you're talking about, 50 or, or you know, 20, uh, put them on a diet, follow uh, them for six months, measure health parameters, and go through the peer review process and publish it in a journal, I'm not going to comment on anything that I see. So I, I do have sort of an intellectual laziness for a lot of the internet noise you see out there. Show me a paper. Show me the study. And then I'll comment on it. At a recent conference, someone, uh, at a lipid conference, someone said, what about the blank diet? And I said, well, you know, it occurs to me that you need to put 50 people on the diet, put, publish it in a peer-reviewed journal, and then I'll comment on it. And there was silence for that kind of approach because now you can get all this information, and yet I'm still uh, at that level, and which is why I don't uh, subscribe or endorse things that don't have these kinds of studies behind it. Now, I was recently helping a PhD student uh, come up with resources and references for her thesis, and she said, well, Dr. Westman, that paper's too old. I can't use it in my PhD thesis. I only can use something within the last five years. So there's going to be kind of a, a loss of the, the um, uh, knowledge, um, but I still think it's um, important to know where this has come from. So Will Yancey, a colleague of mine at Duke, um, uh, after the first study, we said we need to randomize control trials. And so Will is the first author on the Annals of Internal Medicine paper, which was published in 2004. So we were part of the low-carb versus low-fat original, um, now, what, 30, 40 papers comparing low-carb and low-fat. And the, uh, the overwhelming uh, um, conclusion is that low-carb wins out over the low, cap, low um, fat kind of diet. Um, it's not that that other approach can't work, but this is now you know, something that has scientific validity behind it. And uh, if someone asks me, you know, do you believe in a low carb diet? I'll kind of flippantly say, you know, well, do you believe in gravity? <laughs> you know, um, it's science, it's not belief. So ketones, again, the role of ketones is to just provide fuel in the body if you're a fat burner. If you, if you don't eat carbs and you eat proteins and fats, you're going to be predominantly a fat burner. You burn what you eat. So if you want to be a fat burner, just don't eat carbs. That's the bottom line. Of course, you want to make sure you have a, a, a good source of protein, adequate protein. But the ketone levels are... Um, now being described in kind of like early precincts and in, a, in an election, we're getting, you know, we're kind of getting an understanding that the range of ketones for people doing a ketogenic diet is wider than initially estimated, but it's a lot lower than someone who's in diabetic ketoacidosis. And then Will Yancey uh, um, uh, did the extra mile of doing blood gas analyses to look at the actual pH in the blood, not to just... Um, say there's no acidosis, he actually measured the acid base level in these people doing either low-carb, low-fat diet, and there was no acidosis for people who are in nutritional ketosis. So it's very different. Now the problem is, the medical community, we were all trained that, the, and the only time we heard ketosis was in the context of ketoacidosis. And I'll still hear that today. So if you're dealing with um, someone who trained a while back, they're not 
keeping up with this literature, they might um, have in their mind the idea that this is ketoacidosis, which this is not. So the outpatient low-carb trials um, uh, pretty much line them up. Uh, the public health collaboration at the UK is a great place to, on your smartphone, in your doctor's office, pull up the data and put it in front of the, the doctor if, if they're worth um, educating. Um, if they're educable, I guess, let me read, educable. Um, and then now over 12 months, uh, again, we have meta-analyses, which is studies of studies of the low-carb versus low-fat um, round of studies. And clearly, the low-carb diet here, VLC-KD, means very low-carbohydrate ketogenic diet, uh, better than a low-fat diet. What about two years? How far have the studies gone? This is one of the studies, um, or two of the studies, Gary Foster's on the upper right and Yuri Shai in uh, Israel on the bottom left. And basically, low-carb diets have been studied out to two years in these kinds of clinical um, research publications. Um, we know a lot of things about mechanism. Uh, I'm not going to drill down to the LDL so you can breathe a sigh of relief. Um, but um, people eat less. There's a reduction in caloric intake when you do an ad-lib ketogenic diet compared to before. That's why this is known as or, and used as a weight loss kind of diet. Um, in terms of diabetes, it's been known for a long time that eating sugars and starches would raise the blood glucose or in this case, the urine glucose back in 1923. They couldn't measure it in the blood. And so uh, to my surprise, as I was doing the first study uh, in 1999 or so, and the hospital director was lobbied by a dietitian to stop the study we were doing. This is the 50 people in, in a, uh, just over six months. The, um, one of my patients brought in this book. And I was just going through, hmm, what did they use in 1923 for diabetes or for weight loss? And it turns out it was a 10-gram carbohydrate-per-day diet. I have this in my office and did a video. You can YouTube it um, with a doctor over in Nashville. And um, uh, everyone's really uh, intrigued that alcohol is on that list there uh, uh, because it can actually lower the blood glucose. And... Uh, so this is really not new. It's been known for a long time that eating sugars and starches raise blood glucose. Diabetes is a problem of elevated blood glucose. So why don't you just take away the sugars and the starches? Um, this is a, a stylized, or the actual results that, of Dr. Ianfeldt after uh, eating a high-carb, low-fat diet, blood glucose going up to 180. What's not shown is the insulin going up to keep the blood glucose down. And then when you eat a low-carb or zero-carb meal, uh, there's no rise in the blood glucose. So this really kind of makes sense if you're trying to treat diabetes, doesn't it? So our early studies on diabetes were published uh, about this time, 2008. There's a, a new round of studies going on now in diabetes. But if you look at a systematic review, it, and here with percent carb calories on the x-axis and then the change in hemoglobin A1c coming down being better, you know, minus 30% change in the A1c there, the lower the carbohydrate in the diet, the greater the reduction in hemoglobin A1c. It's pretty much common knowledge uh, back 100 years ago and in clinical research review studies today. And in a paper in 2012, again, looking at eating different eating patterns, the low-carb diets, basically 6 out of 10 showed reduction in A1C versus the other types of diets. So other many diets can work. But for diabetes, lowering the blood glucose uh, is achieved better by keeping the carbs as low as possible. Way, another way to look at all the different studies is uh, called a network meta-analysis. And the size of the, the node and the line gives you an idea of how much data there are behind the different approaches. And a low-carb diet has just as much data as uh, pretty much any other studied diet today for diabetes. So again, do you believe in low-carb diets? Um, you know, do you believe in gravity? 
That works really well if someone has, if you have a glass of water on someone's lap, you know. Um, now, sometimes doctors may need that sort of, you know, shock, you know. So, um, I know I'm I am one. And I teach lots of doctors about this. So, um, so now. Uh, it's pretty well established in meta-analyses about obesity and type 2 diabetes um, that uh, this is as good as any other approach or, or even better for treating these diseases. Um, you can hide a lot of issues or, or problems in an average, it's told in the medical world. So Dr. Yancey figured out uh, or thought, why don't I put everybody in the figure, everyone in the in the study in this figure. So this is a study actually comparing the low-carb ketogenic diet in red versus a diet and a drug. So it's a low-fat diet with Orlistat, which is a fat-blocking drug. And it's actually a, um, an approved uh, available drug within the VA system. So this is a study within the VA, Veterans Affairs. And it basically shows that the low-carb diet was as good as a diet and a drug in terms of weight loss. And you can see the individual results and in the, the lighter lines that the, the biggest loser in the study, if you will, in red lost actually 32% of the body weight. So, you know, when you look at averages in studies and all that, it doesn't show you the detail like this. And um, I wish every weight loss or even therapeutic effect paper would show the individual results and the averages just like this. Big study got uh, some news this year in diabetes and the keto diet, low-carb diet. Um, Sarah Hallberg was the first author on this paper where there were 262 people with diabetes followed over a year and they're continuing to follow them. But the one-year results showed that um, if you kept people in nutritional ketosis for a year, that there was an average hemoglobin A1C reduction from 7.6 to 6.3%, and a body weight change of 14 kilograms. And it wasn't achieved by adding medication, this hemoglobin A1C reduction. It was actually done with the reduction or elimination of medication. So insulin was reduced or eliminated in 94% of the 78 subjects on insulin. That's Pretty amazing. Um, now, unfortunately, they didn't uh, randomize people. In the, it was a non-randomized trial. So in my summary papers of diabetes, I can't include it in the randomized trial table. It ends up being in the non-randomized. And it may not have the same impact uh, at the policy level. But they took a, a control group that hadn't um, been given this nutritional ketosis information at all. And that's the improvement they received. So we're able to look now at ketone, ketones. And um, of course, you can do this on your own. Uh, I wonder how many of you are measuring ketones in some way. Yeah, I, I say two thirds of, of you are. Um, well, um, if you had diabetes and were in this study losing weight and nutritional ketosis at 10 weeks, here was the view of what the hemoglobin, excuse me, the beta hydroxybutyrate, the, the blood ketone level was. And most people had a uh, blood ketone level under 0.5. And how many of you have been taught that nutritional ketosis begins at 0.5? Yeah, so uh, it's a don't be so fixated on the blood beta hydroxybutyrate level. In fact, here in this, uh, in the figure legend, which is the, uh, the writing under the figure, the people who had the highest blood beta hydroxybutyrate, 4.4, 2.8, these people were actually on a medication, an SGLT2 inhibitor, which I highly uh, discourage using because of the risks. Um, uh, by themselves and in conjunction with a low-carb diet because they can raise the ketone level. Um, when you look at ketones over time, how many of you were taught that ketones uh, aren't any good after a certain time and, and urine, urine ketones you know, are, aren't good at all after a while? Well, that's not necessarily true. Um, and here, um, the measurement of blood and, in my experience, urine ketones in my clinic actually can be useful to, to in the short run, uh, give you feedback on how you're doing. Um, as a clinical trialist and uh, during different diet studies, 
using the blood ketones or urine ketones is a great measure to show that the people in my study were actually following the program sufficiently, lowering the carbohydrates. So you, you have a good indication of whether someone's actually doing the diet or not. Although weight change is a good indicator um, if you're in a clinical situation too. So, uh, you know, again, I thought just as the science is done, you know, if this were a drug, it, it would be approved by the FDA. It's called phase three approval. So in 2006, we opened a university-based private practice at Duke. We have two rooms adjacent to an internal medicine teaching clinic because that's my clinical home in the Society of General Internal Medicine and General Medicine at Duke within the Department of Medicine. So we teach a lot of residents and students who come through um, the program. We have a, a kind of a minimalist approach with a doctor and a nurse's aide. Uh, there's no behavioral person. There's no exercise physiologist. There's no dietitian. Um, and payment is within the private or public insurance uh, Medicaid, Medicare system, very few people pay out of pocket for this service, um, which I thought was important to see if it could be done within the insurance pay system and also um, to make it more accessible to a wider range of folks. And the first line treatment uh, really for the last 12 years has been the keto diet, low carb, high fat or low carb ketogenic diet, however you want to call it. We're just opening up the uh, the hood, if you will, to look uh, because our electronic medical record changed. We're able to get extract information better. We've seen 4,000 patients, and which represented 28,000 clinic visits that we've charged to insurance, Medicare, Medicaid, which has kept me uh, in uh, a job and uh, my salary being paid. Uh, and even as a tenured professor, I have to bring in money and so you can actually bill for this within the insurance system. Uh, the average person coming through our clinic is uh, 50.5 years old, 74% are female, half and half Caucasian, African American. The average BMI, body mass index, which is the weight divided by the height twice, is 40.5. The definition of obesity is at about 30 kilograms per meter squared, so this is a moderate to severe the affected population. Half of our private, half are public insurance. And over the last five years, we've treated 2,000 patients and helped them lose 26,000 pounds. So, um, do you believe in gravity? Do you, um, <laughs> there's a double standard because a, a doctor using a blood pressure medicine doesn't have to show in their own practice that the blood pressure medicine works. The patient comes back, the blood pressure is lower. And the studies were done to show that they work and they're safe. So there's a double standard that, well, there's no evidence that, yeah, there's a lot of evidence that this works. And in a clinical practice, there's why should I have to prove what the studies have already shown? I see people losing the weight. But then I was remembering the reason uh, I was open to studying this is I visited a doctor who was actually using it in practice. That happened to be Dr. Atkins back in 1998. So that's why even today, you're welcome to come visit, not all at once, uh, <laughs> the Duke Lifestyle Medicine Clinic, and you can see the clinic in action. And there's so many different myths and hurdles and, and misconceptions that I, I, you know it took me to overcome those to, to visit. And then for most doctors even today, this is all kind of, you know, you know it doesn't count or, or whatever, and then seeing it in action actually puts you over into that, well, okay, maybe I will try it, space. Um, I practice the best internal medicine that I ever have just by changing the food. This deserves clap, a clap, right? no, a clap. I actually borrowed that statement from an obesity medicine colleague of mine, Alan Rader. And Bill McCarthy, a colleague of mine in obesity medicine, says, if you know obesity today, you know internal medicine. So 150 years ago, the saying was, if you know syphilis, you know medicine. And now it's, if you know obesity, you know medicine. And the 
uh, clashing of cultures and, and people not being trained. We just aren't taught about food in the medical world. Uh, the medical education process gave up the idea of teaching about food, and it left it to the, you know, looks like the government. And now we're left with a big mess. Uh, but you can do things about this. And now I've treated people not only with diabetes and type uh, and obesity, but PCOS, irritable bowel syndrome, fatty liver, and GERD. All of those uh, in the uh, first bullet there have research publications. Just go to PubMed and type in Westman EC with those diseases. There are papers there. Bread and butter, well, I couldn't write out bread on the second one there. The bread and butter internal medicine patient, the person that I think this shines best, has diabetes, high blood pressure, obesity, and GERD. We can get people off all of those medicines. It may take a little time, a little extra effort, but this is the best internal medicine just by changing the food. Heart failure, yeah, no problem. Pre-heart transplant patients who have implanted left ventricular assist devices, this is called an LVAD, where the heart doesn't even beat well enough, so they put in a pump and put in some tubes into the arteries. And now you have to be careful. You have to watch the salt. You have to watch the vitamin K because they're on warfarin. But there are no new medications. There's no surgery. It's just changing the food. Post-bariatric surgery, weight gain. Now the harsh reality is that most people are regaining the weight even after bariatric surgery. No one even does the lap band anymore in this country because it's just not strong enough. And then the Ruin Y has morphed over into the gastric sleeve because Ruin Y has too many complications for some, some people's um, taste. Uh, uh, you know, the, I, I, in medical education and medical process, you make a decision, am I going to become a surgeon or am I going to become a medical person? There's, you know, there's just different personalities. And even before that, in college, now I'm learning some people decide to become engineers and others decide not to be engineers. And um, I'm not an engineer. Um, so uh, this is really pretty amazing. So this patient came to me 70 years old, had the Ruin Y back in 1984 when it was first done. Went back to the surgeon. Surgeons know surgery, so they revised the surgery, and she really wanted to lose weight. Uh, she ended up um, coming to this obesity medicine specialist. Uh, next slide, please. Um, there we go. And, well, the, the surgical program said you're fixed. You know, you got a 10%, 20% weight loss. And she said, no way, I'm not fixed. So she sought out this obesity medicine specialist who used a keto diet and some fluid management. This is, you know, it's a medical thing for some people. And she's down to a BMI of 23.8, which is her high school weight. Now at the age of, what, 74. Uh, and uh, it's just by changing the food. Oh, it costs about $4,000 for the tr medical treatment, and each surgery is about 20 grand. And so uh, it's also economical. Take people off medicines, people save money. It's so unbelievable, people don't believe it. Now, this gentleman went home and um, he heard the story the, you know, eat as much as you want meat, poultry, fish, and shellfish, and eggs. He started eating three double cheeseburgers a day, no bun, at a fast food place losing 15 pounds a month. Went to spring break down in uh, uh, Florida because in North Carolina, most people go down to Daytona Beach, something like that. He didn't lose weight, but he didn't gain weight. And he drank some carbs down there. Um, um, <laughs> just be careful with the amount. Nothing's forbidden. Just watch the carb amount. And he came back, and he's still losing 10 to 15 pounds a month just eating at fast food restaurants. I don't understand why the fast food industry isn't part of the solution. Do you, do you know why? Oh, do you have to have grass-fed beef? Do you have to have this special? No, you don't. So the, remember the slide on what a low-carb keto diet was? It's the number of total grams of carbs per day. That's the most important thing. Okay. Take people off of insulin 
no problem. So don't do this on your own at home if you're on insulin, uh, unless you know what you're doing. If you're a nurse, a doctor, well, that doesn't mean you know. Um, <laughs> add up all the insulin. This person's on 100 units. The far bar on the left, the first visit, uh, he uh, is taught to cut the carbs out so that if someone is going to cut the carbs from 200 a day to 20 carbs a day, you have to cut the insulin in half on the first day, or they will have a low blood sugar. They may have a low blood sugar in a car. As I was walking across for lunch, there's this person walking by at five, or driving by at five miles an hour. It was about a 70-year-old woman. She looked out the window and said, my blood sugar is low. I don't know where I am. She's driving in a car at a 45 mile an hour street. No, 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 don't laugh. Please don't laugh. I know and it seems kind of funny, but no, this is what's happening today. Is people are getting too much insulin and, and they are not necessarily taught what to do. So what is any doctor gonna do? I ran the other way. And, no, I didn't. I reached in, put the car in park, and I said, what's the problem? She says, my blood sugar is too low. I don't know where I am. Okay, that's the person, she didn't know that she needed glucose. She needed some sugar. So thankfully, I looked in the car and the passenger seat and there was a bag and there was an Atkins bar in it. <laughs> Knowing what I know, I said, great, there's enough sugar in there that she can have it. And it rescued her. Now, because it's total carbs that matters, not net carbs. I've had a lot of people who eat those things and then that blocks their results and and so be sensitive to anything that you're eating. It could slow things down. Point being, reduce the insulin immediately. This person is off insulin by six weeks. Really hasn't lost much weight. You're titrating the, the diabetes medicine to the carbohydrate in the food. Cut the carbs down. you got to cut the medicine down immediately. This person's off 80 units in one week. This is pretty cool. Um, you can take people off 60 units and on blood, uh, on pills, pills in these shots and all these, they're, they're just not as potent as insulin. They usually stop them immediately. Um, 100 units per day off three, so this is not like a random event, it's predictable. And uh, this is the clinical experience, the Hallberg paper, uh, and uh, shows it in the recent clinical research study this year. It doesn't seem to matter how long someone's been on insulin. This person's on insulin for 10 years, off of insulin in a week, almost 180 units of insulin. So be careful, uh, or be energized. Uh, you can actually fix diabetes. Of course, this is type 2 diabetes we're talking about. On insulin for 25 years, off in five weeks. And then the record I have, uh, fellow is on 500 units. Now, you know, the medical world has said, this is no problem. We'll just make the insulin more concentrated. So we'll give, it's called U500. So they need less injection, but it's more potent. And it's also very expensive. So this fellow is still on insulin, uh, but he's on about 50 to 100 units of insulin now, three years later, because he still has 100 pounds of weight to lose. So there's an initial reduction because of the food change, and then there's the long-term fix of diabetes, which has to go along with the abdominal obesity. Some people come off all the insulin immediately. Some people stay on it until the obesity is fixed. I don't know how to predict that yet, other than by watching the blood glucoses carefully. Um, this person, after six months, is still on insulin, again, because look at the weight at the bottom, 316 pounds down to 278 pounds. Now, in the mechanistic studies that we were applying to do research, they said, you know, you're doing too many things. So this would have been criticized because you change the food and then the diabetes is better, but you also had that person lose 40 pounds. So that's not, you're not doing just one thing. This is, so, yeah, so they're criticizing the study protocol because you're doing too well or you're doing more than one thing. And so I'm giving you the big picture view. I'm not so worried about the mechanisms because from the big picture, all of these things are getting better. Um, 140, oh, insulin pump doesn't seem to matter. It's all just insulin and just reduce it and watch it like crazy. Um, 
Hemoglobin A1c is a measure of the blood glucose over three months. So here on the left-hand side, this person had an A1c of seven and a half and the blue line until the, you know, came to us and the blood uh, A1c went down to 5.5% off of all medication. So this is the bread and butter internal medicine case that's gumming up the internal medicine clinics and family practice clinics and causing all the money that's being spent today with diabetes, hypertension, heartburn, all these things. This person's not even measuring the blood glucose anymore. Doesn't have to. Doesn't even have diabetes. That's pretty amazing. If you're in the, well, as a patient or as a provider, if you're, uh, uh, um, let me uh, rephrase that, these new medications called SGLD2 inhibitors are getting all of the, the hype and even advertisements on TV because they lower heart disease events. So cardiologists are all on board, but in the clinical trials, you're not um, giving a lot of different people, uh, um, a wider spectrum of people, the drug. So they, didn't, they may not have seen ketoacidosis in the studies, but we're seeing them now in the clinics. So uh, I, at the Duke Clinic, for um, 12 years, we had never seen a case of ketoacidosis with nutritional ketosis until this drug came along. And so we've seen already two cases of life-threatening ketoacidosis um, ICU treatment, someone's really ill, and it was from these medications. Now in the paper here, you see the, um, the diet was blamed, not the drug. So I'm not a, big, I'm not a pharma guy anymore. I've become the doctor who, that I didn't want to be. The doctor I looked up to said, you know, any drug can do anything. Well, that, I don't believe that. Well, I believe that now. And so be very wary of any kind of medication. Um, this one is just, uh, um, especially in combination with a low-carb diet that generates ketosis, um, can cause this kind of life-threatening problem. Just to end up, while national guidelines are still in flux and the Nutrition Coalition is a great place to focus efforts, the obesity medicine guideline, which includes lifestyle, uh, lifestyle medication and very low calorie diets now includes the guideline or recommendation of using a very low carbohydrate or keto diet for the treatment of obesity in the Obesity Medicine Association guideline. So you're not the first one to talk about this. If you need to go to a, a, you know, a distinguished group to show, actually there is a national organization that includes the keto diet in their guideline which is pretty amazing, thanks to the Obesity Medicine Association. Um, also in the diabetes world, the American Diabetes Association is kind of a schizophrenic view. When Will Yancey is on the papers and he's on the guidelines, low-carb diets are in the review. So Will Yancey's a colleague of mine. So actually you can find resources from the American Diabetes Association that says the, the low-carb diets are okay. And then they toggle back to they're not okay when Dr. Yancey's not on the panel. Very interesting. So the politics of this, yeah, I thought this was just going to be do the study, publish the paper, and uh, along the way there have been these like spokes in the tire of your bicycle that have... Uh, stop that easy progression. Um, so let me just summarize and uh, wrap up with what we're doing to continue this. The low-carb phase three studies, the, the clinical research is done. It's not a belief, it's science. And Dr. Yancey has an ongoing VA Veterans Affairs study comparing the keto diet with usual care and that uh, with a, and a sample size of about 260. And it is a randomized trial, which I hope will build upon the Hallberg paper. Clinical experience, in my experience, and Dr. Yancey is a component of the clinic that I run, We've just not seen any frequent adverse events, any AEs, and we've definitely not seen an epidemic of heart disease. I work in a, a pretty contained university practice sharing patients with other doctors, and no one's coming to me saying, you know, you caused his death, you caused that death, you caused that. So I don't see 
it, but you know, um, clinical practice can't see small things. And so what we're going to do is uh, retrospective analyses of the clinical cohort that we have. And we want to get that into the uh, peer-reviewed publications as well. We still need, in this last bullet, multi-site, meaning large studies with low-carb, high-fat, or keto diets with clinical endpoints of death and dying, of hospitalizations, heart attacks, that sort of thing. It would be great to do one without the hyperlipidemia treatment, you know, uh, even including that as a variable. Uh, and uh, I don't think we need these to show that it works. We know it works. It's science, but we, if we're going to compare it to any other approach, then you need the randomized trials now. Uh, and to really kind of put to bed the idea that the cholesterol going up is going to kill you eventually, even though every other thing got better. So with that, thank you for uh, um, your attention.